All right, welcome back. And I'm really excited that you did make it back here today because we have a really great panel coming up. Uh, the next panel, Mistakes Happen, But They Don't Have to Be Repeated, has a very captivating story to tell. Please welcome NACA's National Runway Safety Rep, Bridget Singratanakul, Senior Vice President of AOPA Safety Institute, Richard McSpadden, Corporate Pilot, Sharky Contra, and NACA's National Human Performance Rep, Aaron Katz. Hey, good afternoon, guys. Aaron did get a little bit more loud of applause than I did, so I won't hold it against you, but we'll talk in the hall. Uh, <laughs> all right, so have any of you guys been involved in a pilot deviation before? Raise your hands, keep them up, and did you, did you ever hear back? Did you ever hear why it happened? Okay, I should actually should have let you down and put them back up if you did. Because I think the majority of you would say, no, I never heard it back. I have no idea what happened. I don't know what was going on in the cockpit. I just, we never got any information back. So another thing I'd like to say is, in our NAS, we have aircraft that are lining up for either landing or attempting to land at the, whether it's the wrong airport, on the wrong runway, or even a taxiway, literally every other day in the, in the NAS. So majority of the time, these are happening at closely spaced parallel runways with an offset. They're happening during the day, VMC. Before we continue, I would like to thank Sharky because I, as I mentioned before, you don't usually hear what happens on the other side of the mic. Well, we're gonna watch a video here in a second. She's the voice of November 06 Juliet. She's the other side of the mic. So it takes a ton of courage for you to be here with us today. Thank you. Thank uh, you. As we continue. <laughs> Let's play the tape. What do you see here? Closely spaced, parallel runways, offset. Target's going to drop. Sharky was flying November 06 Juliet and accidentally landed on the wrong runway when Southwest was on final. And then you saw the pilot initiated go around. Before we get to Sharky, which I'm sure a majority of you would like to hear from her, I'd like to talk to Aaron first. Aaron's our national human performance rep. And when you see this type of event, what comes to your mind? Well, I'll tell you what. Um... When you called me about a month ago and you asked me to come out and do this panel, I was both uh, flattered and humbled. And uh, as, after I hung up with you and I thought, oh, stuff just got real, um, I was nervous of coming up here and making a mistake, right? And one awards acceptance speech later, uh, those, mistake, those worries went right out the window. So thank you, Mark. I owe you a drink tonight. Um, <laughs> 
So when we look at, well, and, and, and I think it's important to level set the discussion uh, before we get into the how and why's that mistakes happen <coughs> and that think about everybody in this room and everybody back at the facility right now in this moment, sitting at a radar scope, looking out the window of a tower cab, making the right decision every time. <laughs> Multiply that by every controller that's out there right now and extrapolate that over a year and you have this giant number of decisions. And of that huge number, the amount that actually produce an error to be that small probably defies the mathematical laws of probability and it's a testament to the workforce and the great work that we do and everybody that's back home right now. So um, it's important to set that, that it's unbelievable how many times we get it right versus wrong. But now that I feel better, we can talk about the times that were less than fully correct. Um, there's two different types when you look at errors through the human factors lens that really stand out for this type of work. Um, and the first one doesn't sound very scientific, but it actually is referred to as a mistake. And it's, uh, it's basically an, an error of intent. A person has options to choose from. Uh, sound familiar, folks? And they choose one that does not produce the desired result. It always usually traces back to they didn't have the necessary information to make the right choice, or they didn't understand the intricacies of each choice when they acted. Right? Mm -hmm. We know what that looks like in the operation. In your personal life, it might be you need a USB something for your camera and you spend so much time uh, looking at different choices and focusing on price that you click it, you order it, and when you show up, it shows up, you realize it wasn't compatible with the camera. You, you left that part out, right? Yeah. Um, the second type of error is called a slip. And from the human factor standpoint, again, these are the ones that are actually really dangerous um, because they're unintentional. Uh, usually we, when we get to the end of the story, or, or I should say what we call the end of the story as it pertains to the operation, we say we might chalk it up to you had a bad day or I just didn't have my A game that day. But the reality is slips are indicators, they're warnings, they're red flags that just often go either ignored or unnoticed, right? So that kind of gets me into pre-flight. So Sharky, I was kind of thinking, so in other words, I want to get into the flight, but I want to get into the pre-flight, because there's elements of that too, right? So can you describe what you were planning for and even working on? Okay. Um, yeah, like Aaron said, it was a perfect day. I was uh, a week out from, uh, I had already, um, uh, scheduled my check ride for my commercial certificate and it was going to be the following week and I was out in the practice area practicing approaches or practicing maneuvers and my instructor said you got this which were his famous words you got this and so I thought this time I really believed him I was ready so we went back to the airport and it was a September day in fact it was 2016 exactly this week so kind of interesting the date how it's fallen into place but um, the runway orients uh, 28, landing 28, and it was a beautiful VFR, perfect day, and we were going to do some um, uh, accuracy landings. So that's what we were setting up for. Did you have any else on board, or were you by yourself? No, I had my instructor on board. So CFII. So you had a CFII, it's VMC, during the daylight. You're flying a Piper Aero, working on your commercial, got your right. DE scheduled, you're ready to go, right? Right, so I planned my commercial uh, certificate check ride, and then the two days after that, I was going to Coeur d'Alene to get my commercial seaplane rating, if everything went well, and I was counting on it. <laughs> so, Richard, I wanna pivot over to you a little bit. Um, so, when you were the commander of the Thunderbirds, you're obviously working with highly skilled professionals. How did the team or individuals like just basic recognition of mistakes. Yeah, I, I, you know, something that Aaron just spoke about really resonated with me. I, we didn't have the right terminology for it, but the slips uh, category that you mentioned, what we learned over the course of our flying was that if we made small mental errors that in the moment weren't significant, uh, but collectively they indicated that your head just isn't in the game, you know, which, which is an easy way to dismiss it, we took that as a pretty serious sign that we're not sure why, and it's really not even important why, 
but our head's not in the game today and we're not up to flying at the level that we normally would. And I've actually ported that over into my GA flying, and we talk about the lot in, in GA, I lead safety for AOPA. And we, have, we, we really talk about a three mistakes rule, and we kept that in the Thunderbirds. If you make three sort of mental mistakes, like you, you set the wrong uh, altimeter, or you notice that you forgot to strap in uh, when, you, when you cranked up, it's on your checklist, usually your pre-start, little things like that, if we noticed three of those, when I was with the Thunderbirds, we would terminate maneuvering and go home. And then we'd try to figure out why were we having these little mental mistakes. So that's one of the ways we tried to protect against the, against the slips. For me, self-assessment's hard, right? So what you're talking about actually kind of resonates in our workforce too, I think. Because being able to just acknowledge the fact and recognizing, like, maybe this isn't my day, right? I, how does that resonate with you, Aaron? Well, no one knows you better than you know yourself, right? But it's also probably easiest to lie to yourself. Um, I mean, I think we need to learn in, the, in our profession. Um, when, when you have to be right all the time or really bad things can happen, um, it's time to start acknowledging these stressors that we carry with us to work. Um, I don't know anybody that leads such a charm life that they don't have any stress. Um, but even if you had no cares in the world and you show up to the facility, this is a hard job and it matters. Um, mm -hmm. It asks a lot of you, it takes a lot from you. And if you're not noticing um, these things that are happening to you on a daily basis and really seeing like, I may not be at my best today um, or just dismissing them like some silly mistake, like sending a text message meant for your spouse to the wrong person. I have done that. <laughs> uh, something that's happened to me since this panel sort of became a stressor for me in my life, thank you, Bridget. Uh, getting up <laughs> and walking into a room and going, the hell did I come in here for? I don't remember, right? These, are, these things are weighing on me, right? And they're robbing me of my focus, and so by Allowing yourself, I think, as the captain said yesterday, to take ownership of things. Take ownership of your stressors that you're carrying around. Have an honest conversation with yourself. Probably in the car, not in the operation. That would just be weird. But put them out in the universe, right? That's how you start to transition from owning the things that are weighing you down instead of letting them own you. Bridget, I think is one of the hardest things to do. To uh, We all know fatigue is bad and it impacts our performance. We all know too much stress is bad and it impacts our performance. Mm -hmm. But how do you know when it's too much? It's one of the hardest things to detect. And what Aaron's mentioning and what we notice are these slips or some indicators. Some other indicators I've noticed are if I tend to start getting irritable with people that are providing me what would be helpful input, and my irritability comes from I'm, I'm behind mentally and I don't want more information, even though the more information is really important. So I find that those are real clues to me, the irritability factor, the small mental mistakes factor, those are clues to me that I'm either tired or stressed or one of those factors. I could see that. I mean, how many times have you driven home and just it's so much for routine and you kind of daze off, especially on a hard day and you're like, Next thing you know, you're just pulling into the driveway. But I have no idea how I got here, right? Um, Sharky, so you were working on your commercial, right? That's correct. As part of your commercial, we work on precision landings, right? Say that again? You work on precision landings? Yes. So um, it, I had asked for a short approach, which I believe you heard. And so precision landing, for those of you who don't know what that actually is, um, the the uh, instructor or the designated pilot examiner, the examiner in, in the case for the following week, will determine where you, they want you to land. So you cut the power on the downwind, usually beam the numbers, and then you do whatever it takes to get on that spot. Usually we focus on the thousand foot, foot marker. So if anybody's use, uh, familiar with an arrow, they pretty much just fall like a, a brick. I mean, that's yeah. the saying. If you throw a brick out the window, the plane's gonna go faster than the brick. But um, basically you compensate for winds, there were no winds that day. Um, the weight of the aircraft slip and use flaps in order to get to that spot. And you have to nail it, because you only get one chance and an, um, 
uh, during your check ride. So that was the first, my first landing was that particular one, and I nailed the thousand foot marker. Only my, the instructor and I looked, I was like, yeah, I did it. And then I realized as I saw the Boeing 737 go over to my left that that did not look right. And the instructor and I looked at each other and how did we get here? We're, we're like, we just got teleported. What, what <laughs> happened? So, and then I knew that it was a deviation and I thought I was, I was done, my career was done and I was gonna lose my certificate and never get to fly again. Um, the instructor was actually, he says, well, I'm an instructor on the plane, I own this with you. And so anyway, I, um, yeah, it, it was terrifying to think how it could have been a diff different situation if that Boeing 737 pilot had not had the wherewithal or had, did not see me go to the wrong runway. I mean, there could have been horrible, horrible deaths, so. Yeah, to add to that, I think, Sharky, that that power off 180 precision landing is the most busted item on a commercial check ride. Mm -hmm. So it's an intense maneuver. I mean, as a pilot, you're intensely yeah. focused on that maneuver. It takes a lot of skill and a lot of practice to do it right. So I, I can see how you would be, and your instructor, totally focused. Your check ride's coming up. You've got to figure out this power off 180. It was interesting. It wasn't the first time that I'd done that. And I knew where my visuals were. I knew what to do. And when it, the air traffic controller said, uh, Boeing 737, to your right, we both looked back and then I focused on that thousand foot marker. So it's still to this day puzzling to me that I landed on the wrong runway. I mean, they're close together, but um, I have some thoughts and theories about how that could have happened, but yeah, it's. We were actually talking about that backstage when mm -hmm. you suffered probably from something called an attention slip, which is you were, like Richard's saying, you were so focused on hitting that spot, mm -hmm. that spot, that mark correctly, and it's a high intensive maneuver that um, you lose a little bit of sight of the big picture, right? And you did everything perfect, except that one piece of the big picture was you happen to be on the wrong runway. I've had that happen before. I was in a horrible mountain bike accident where I was having the best day. I thought, I, I got this. And I just went around a corner, slipped on the sand, hit a rock, it tossed me. And interestingly enough, it was right before I started flying. So maybe that's what I needed to get to this path. But. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I was having the best day ever, and a lot of times that happens where you're just, you think you're gonna nail it, and all of a sudden, we were talking about that back there, where um, you have your best experience, and then something happens, and it turns into something that seems like a tragedy. Now, as a result, this has actually taken down me down another path, and here I am sitting with you fine people and this amazing audience. So, so it was a good I'd thing actually met Sharky at an RSAT. So we do these things called special focus RSATs where we pick numerous airports within the NAS where my counterpart and myself go in and have conversations. During one of those special focus RSATs, we were actually briefing the event and that's where I met her. So from that conversation, we were able to get where we're at today. We've also done different interviews together and trying to spread the message and making people aware of more of what's going on in the NAS. Because I mentioned, she's not alone. Like we really see these types of events occurring pretty much every other day in the NAS. So we mentioned perfection. That day, she was aiming for perfection because she had that DE ride and you only, I have my commercial multi. I understand, like, I've tried to hit that. I understand exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So when we're aiming for perfection day in and day out, and we talk as controllers as you have to be 100%, 100% of the time, right? We're human too. So Aaron, how do we relate with that? Well, we're kind of victimized by some of the false narratives that live around this job, right? And when you've ever met someone that's not in the profession, you tell them what you do, the first thing they always say is that, it, oh, that must be so stressful, right? It's a precise job and the stakes are high, public safety's, um, you know, what we're here to protect. And, um, you know, it's, it, the stress comes from having to be right all the time, uh, like you said. And this job would be probably really easy if we could somehow compartmentalize and be robots and say just this part. But um, we have a saying here that <clears throat> this job is about hours of boredom, minutes of excitement, and moments of terror, right? 
And those moments of terror, minutes of excitement will find you and they'll remind you just how human you are. You don't have to look any further than the amazing people we have gathered here that we're gonna stand up and honor tomorrow night at the Archie League Banquet. Let them tell you about um, being there when it mattered the most yeah. and the choices that they made outside of the operation that they took with them that day, thankfully, helped them maintain safety or maybe the outcomes to those stories would be different. So Richard, you're obviously former commander of the Thunderbirds, right? So. I would assume you'd have members of the team that would want to push the envelope. I know I would, probably. <laughs> but, so what kind of challenges would that bring for you? Yeah, it, it was a constant factor. Um, there was that, and then uh, there was also the fact that uh, I, I know people in this audience experience that, this, that when you are in a high-risk environment, time and time and time again, at some point you become callous to the risks that you're taking day in and day out. And whenever you see that creeping into your operation, you have to figure out how to step back. And I'll give you a, an example. We had this superbly talented uh, pilot on, on our team. He was Thunderbird 5. And one of the maneuvers he would perform is he would flip up inverted, and he would go down to about 200 feet off the deck, and he's about, you know, five, 600 miles an hour just inverted. And one time, and I, as the commander, I would always go and watch their tapes and make sure we're doing everything right and, and by the book and people are abiding by minimums and all that stuff. And one time I'm watching this tape and he flips over upside down, he holds inverted. And remember, when you're inverted flying an airplane, your controls are reversed. So normally, if you're right side up, you pull back on the stick, you climb, you push forward on the stick, you dive. But when you're upside down, that's reversed. To climb, you gotta push on the stick. It's intuitive, but you can't even for a second forget that. And so he's inverted and he's doing probably 600 miles an hour at 200 feet and he starts fiddling with something on his canopy. And so... At 200 feet? At 200 feet, yeah, 600 miles an hour or so. Oh. So I pause the tape, I call him into the office and I say, what are you doing? And he says, there was a bug on my canopy, it was really bugging me up there. <laughs> I said, dude, I think it's time for you to just take a knee, you know? <laughs> so, um, and that was a case where this superbly talented Tyler had just become callous to the risk he was taking every day. Mm -hmm. And at some point, we have to really step back and reacquaint ourselves with, with the, the element of that risk and what the consequences can be if we get it wrong. It's almost like an educational, like, training piece, too, then. Yeah, I think so. What is that? So one of the questions here, that I was reading basically was discussing like how do we intertwine that into our training? How do we, the element of, because like, you're basically talking about acknowledging and self-assessing the fact that you've had multiple, multiple mistakes or slips really. Once you get to that point, like even as a, like as a controller, Aaron, what's one of the ways that we can recognize for training purposes, how is there a way that potentially we could help train people to recognize the slips? Because to me, it, it kind of sounded like there's a pretty distinct difference between a slip and a mistake. Yeah, I mean, when you have a slip or something like that, usually the first emotion associated with it is shame or embarrassment. You know, you really look around, well, I don't, I can't turn my head, but you hope that nobody was watching, um, you know, and you really got to credit Sharky here, she had this moment in her training, she wasn't even finished. And something like that could easily derail or even define a person and maybe you wouldn't be a pilot if you had let it beat you. But you basically had the courage to step up and say, okay, I did something wrong, but it's not the end of my story and I turned my vulnerability into strength, right? As far as training goes, we have to stop believing that as people, we, normal people are not capable of compartmentalization. You, you, you've all heard you say, like, I leave home at home and work at work. You carry that stuff around with you no matter where you go. And if you wanna be in the best position to have the lowest probability of having an error at work, um, everything that you do in the hours that lead up to it have interplay on that. And we have to stop pretending that we're somehow adopting this robotic personality that people think we have as controllers because we have to be right all the time. Um, you're very much human and you're, su you're subject to all of the conditions, right, uh, that, of the, that come with being human. Um, people need to understand too, there are physiological responses that happen to you when something unanticipated happens, right? Think in your personal life. 
you're driving down the street at 50 miles an hour, you got a green light, just as you enter the intersection, boom, you see to your left, someone's running the light and you're about to get T-boned, right? This is the part of the story where like the matrix music keys in and everything slows down. You have a physiological response in your brain at that point, um, a part of your brain called the prefrontal cortex. It controls motor skills and problem solving and um, working memory. And we refer to it as the startle effect. It's that moment in time when this thing you were not ready for out of left field hits you, boom, and it's like your brain short circuits for a second or maybe five seconds or 15 seconds, which is like an eternity, right, when everybody's doing 700 miles an hour. Um, and all of the choices that you've made outside the operation will define how quickly you can restart your brain and fix this problem now that you have to deal with, right? It's one thing if you're gonna be in a car accident on the street, it's something totally different if Sharky or Richard are the ones up there in that, those planes that you, they're counting on you to basically walk home that day, right? So Sharky, you obviously, we know we made a mistake, right? I have to, I have to say, the fact that you, and Aaron acknowledges, but I'm gonna acknowledge it again, the fact that you got back into that aircraft over and over again, you got, obviously got your commercial, what, and now you've exceeded to? Right, so now I'm a uh, CFII, so Certified Flight Instructor with Instrument. And, well, I didn't have a choice, that's just who I am, and I think most of the people in this room are, tend to, I mean, you wouldn't be an air traffic controller or a pilot if you weren't more of an A-type personality. So I had to, and the other thing is I'm not, um, even though it was embarrassing, I really wanted to share this with others because I realized it could have been a disaster, but if I share my story, then maybe others will be more inclined to share their story or admit their mistake. And the FAA and NATCA were really, really good to me as far as once I admitted what I had done and talked through it, everybody was super supportive. So I had a, a phenomenal for support system around me to help me get over it and, and move on. And that's helped me when I'm instructing my students on how to behave and, and to deal with um, mistakes and slips. So how do you now lower the likelihood of this type of event happening? I'm sure it's changed your life to oh. uh, like. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, number one, it's difficult for most pilots or many pilots to even talk to air traffic control because I instruct at um, in controlled and uncontrolled airspace. I prefer to talk to air traffic control myself because I, I like someone, another set of eyes to see and avoid. But I do have um, colleagues and students that are very uncomfortable with that. And so I, my students, they, I expect them to talk through what they're doing, their checklist, uh, and we go to, to um, can, Boise is a class Charlie airspace, so we go to the airspace and they have to, from the very beginning so that they get more comfortable with it. Um, we practice emergencies. The other thing is verifying the runway because expectation bias in an airport like Boise where we have two runways and most of the GA is on the south side and most of the traffic on a VFR day is on the north side and pilots just think, oh, well, I'm on, well, GA pilots anyway, they kind of have this expectation that because they're doing traffic on the south side, they're gonna stay on the south side. And I mean, that's not what happened with me there, but as I've flown corporate I and um, just in, in Boise and being switched, can you take 2-8 right instead of 2-8 left? And I verbalize it first of all so that it sticks in my brain. And if I'm instructing somebody, then I have them verbalize it and then I say verify 2-8 left or 2-8 right, whatever we were. And then of course, if we don't remember, clarify. And that's the hardest thing for a lot of <clears throat> students to do. Now the pilots in this audience, you're already air traffic controllers, so it's not as intimidating most likely to you, but to a student who's never been up in the tower, then they don't know because there's this image, which is what I over, tried to overcome when I was a, a baby pilot. I went up to the air traffic control tower because I was ex just very intimidated. And <clears throat> the one thing that we kind of talked about before that you and I've discussed is the I'm safe acronym. Yes. And 
I kind of, I think that resonates with us a little bit. Can you kind of describe that for us? Right, so it's an acronym that I ask all of my students, um, and myself for that matter, to describe to me um, where they are emotionally and physically, and I is illness, M medication, S stress, A um, um, alcohol, um, F fatigue, and E energy, exercise, emotion, or whatever E may um, mean to you, but to me it's all one and the same. You, you, they work together. So I ask all my students, say, most have just gotten off work because I'm an, more of an evening instructor, and I'll say, where are you in, re in regards to all of these things? And it helps them identify that, oh, maybe I'm not really in the right space. And I tell them, if you cancel right now, or we do a pre-flight and you decide to cancel, that's okay. You're not, it's not my flight, it's your flight. And, and that's how I deal with it. I, don't, I know some instructors aren't like that because that's how they make all their money. For me, it, I'm doing it because I absolutely love it. Well, Alyssa, I mean, you're also, what, an accountant as well? <laughs> I was you're that an accountant too, right? Yes, so. my day job is accounting. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm as nerdy as they get. The, so Aaron, when we're hearing about like the I'm safe acronyms and stuff, is there anything that could kind of resonate with us a little bit with regards to air traffic? You know, I was sitting here thinking as she was talking, it's like when we walk into the operation and we get ready to take a position, we've got a whole checklist to go over when they're, we're relieving somebody, right? These are all the things that are going on right now, but how many of us actually stop, maybe take a minute and on the way to work or in the parking lot before you walk in and put yourself through your own mental checklist? Like, I think these are the places we need to start getting to, and maybe it's the onus is on us to put some structure around something that would help you take that mental assessment on, do, am I in my A-game place today? Like, what is bothering me? How, can I put it out in the universe and it'll bother me just a little bit less? I need to find a process just to set down some of this emotional baggage so that I don't take it with me into the facility. It'll be in the car when I get back, trust me. I can deal with it then, right? <laughs> um, what, what, what has my diet been like today? How well did I sleep last night? Is there something keeping me up? What is the number one or two things that I'm dealing with at home? What's making the most demands on my time? And by just saying them, you start to take that power over them and take away their power from you because these are the things that rob your alertness when you're sitting on position, as your thoughts go to wander, right? And before you know it, boom, there's that unanticipated event, and you're not in the place you need to be um, to have the best possible outcome. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a great way of putting it. I um, often say that I'm going to get an altitude adjustment, and I do just that. I put everything on the ground, let gravity take over, and then once I'm in the air, then none of that matters anymore because I can't let it matter, and I, I hope that I instill that practice to my students so that they can also let things go. Mm -hmm. And Yeah. You know, we've tried to help pilots implement personal minimums. So we all know there's rules about when, how low you can fly and the weather and all that and alternates when you need all that. But th those are based on you being at your absolute best and your absolute most proficient. And we try to help pilots understand that if you haven't flown in a while or you're just barely current but not proficient, current's legal, proficient is safe, then you should step up those minimums. And so we encourage them to establish personal minimums. But the hard part of that is, so we have a little pamphlet they can fill out and it's all free, we, we invite them to download it. But the hard part of that is, so many times we've been through accident reviews where the person had personal minimums set but then on that day they were coming in, but they really needed to waive that minimum because they really needed to get there. And so what we've learned is we encourage them, set your personal minimums with a colleague or a spouse or a friend, and then you can't waive them in the moment. You have to go back to that colleague or spouse and talk about why you think you can step down your personal minimums based on certain criteria. Because if you allow yourself to waiver it in the moment because you need to, you always will, it's a worthless document. And what's the point? It's not even like a contract anymore. Yeah. I like the fact that you're communicating with somebody else that this is my standard, basically. This is what's acceptable for me. Yeah. And I think by, I like the fact that you put that information out there because by vocalizing it, uh, I 
feel like it would probably make you live it a little bit better, yeah. right? So I wanted to get, so Sharky, you were in a Piper Arrow when the event took place. Back when you were commanding the Thunderbirds, they're obviously an F-16, so speed, <laughs> a little bit different. Um, things obviously happen very, very quickly, right? So how do you or anyone under your command, how do they better prepare themselves for like, for the element of just getting back into the plane. Like, what did you guys do, whether it's educational piece, like, I mean, we, we do remedial training sometimes, but yeah. what, like, what kind of processes did you guys do? Yeah, that's, that's a good question, because we took uh, proficiency very seriously. So we would never go more than two days without flying a demonstration profile. Uh -huh. And if we did, we would raise our minimums and spread our formation out, just automatically. We just, even if, even if we thought we were proficient enough, it didn't matter. It was a hard and fast rule. More than two days, and we raise the floor, we spread the formation until we fly at least one, and then we can close it back in again. So that proficiency element helped us stay in the game mentally. And then, um, I, I don't know if, I, I'm not familiar very much with the controller environment, but for pilots, you can chair fly just about every scenario you're in. And when I was the commander of, of the Thunderbird, when I first started learning to lead that profile, I would walk around my house, walking through the maneuvers, talking over the speeds, mimicking the calls I would make. So much so that my kids out playing would do the same thing because they'd heard it <laughs> over and over so many times. And so that kind of repetitive uh, work that would take, take off the, a, a lion's share of the workload because I just knew it by memory was a tremendous benefit to us. Aaron, can you resonate with that at all? Oh, absolutely. I mean, reinforcing, and, and we have a culture in, in our profession, right, where um, vulnerability is not something that we gravitate towards, right? We, especially the more time you spend doing this and you get that pounded into your psyche that, being right all the time, being right all the time. The longer you go, and maybe you haven't had a mistake and an error, and I hope that you know many of you haven't, um, you start to get pretty convinced of your own uh, inability to make a mistake, right? And it can be, become hard to deal with it at that point, and then you're really increasing the likelihood um, that something's waiting for you. You might push the envelope a little farther than you need to because you know, it's just sort of human nature, right? I mean, at the end of the day, this all traces back for us as controllers to professionalism. We're not here to prove anything. Um, maybe when you're young and you first get checked out and you're insecure and eventually your confidence builds up and maybe you wanna see how much you can get out there and that's okay. We work as a team though at the end of the day because we're not here for us. We're here for the NAS, right? The, the flying community. I think you have to keep that in the forefront at all times. The best shift is the one where everything goes exactly the way it's supposed to. and. It's boring as all get out, right? That's what we and do. how often does that happen? <laughs> Thanks to these people and everyone like them, just about every day. Yeah, they say in the pilot world that there's no perfect flight, although, I don't know, I think it depends on who's asking or who's defining that. Yeah, I think you make a really good point. You made it a couple times, Aaron, that um, there's a perception of GA that GA is unsafe. Now, compared to the airlines, you know, we have a different uh, safety record. But here's what goes unnoticed. We fly 25 million flight hours a year in GA. That's more than 20 million operations. And we have about 200 fatal accidents a year. That's still 200 too many. But the 25 million that go unnoticed uh, are sometimes frustrates me as a, as a GA guy. That's just human nature, right? Um... There's, there's a lot of people here, and you know, I don't know how familiar you are with the labor world, but we're, we're labor advocates, and we have what we call FAC reps, who are the presidents of their local, and they're there to you know, uh, work with their management counterparts and on behalf of everyone. Um, you know, it's, uh, you, can, you can have 100 people in your facility, and you put everything that you have into doing the right thing, the right, making the right decision for the right reason, and if 99 people are happy and one person's upset, that one person is what's gonna stand out and just tear you up. You, you're just wired that way, right? And it's not, uh, I'm so glad 99 people are happy, it's why is this one person unhappy? 
We got a question from the audience that I'd like to talk about. It says, "How do you ex how do you distinguish between slips that actually we are that actually are the result of a bad day and slips that are red flags of a bigger problem?" <clears throat> so, that's actually a really good question. That's awesome. Um, here's the really kind of scary thing, if we're being honest. Um, the process that your brain experiences when you have a slip looks the same if you are sending a text message to the wrong person mm -hmm. or issuing an aircraft the wrong frequency. Your, your brain doesn't differentiate those things, right? That information slips through the cracks somehow, and it can be exacerbated by fatigue or the fact that people are spending far more than 40 hours a week in the facilities now, right? This is just compounding this problem. It's, it's what's at stake that differentiates these things. I can say I'm sorry to sending the wrong text message to someone, but again, if I'm in that, if I'm in that uh, facility and a person's counting on me for their safety and, and it doesn't go the way it's supposed to, that's a much... That's not something you can apologize. Aaron, for. I'd love to get your reaction to this. My initial reaction to that was it, it doesn't matter. It, it, it doesn't matter. It's a, it's a slip and you just assess it as such and realize if I have two or three of those or more, then it's, you know, it's, it's not worth continuing the operation. Or in your case, I know it's harder for you guys. You can't just say, hey, I've had three slips, I'm out. You know, somebody else come in. <laughs> um, but maybe, Need a break. maybe you know, you could raise your hand to the soup or, you know, just suggest that, hey, I'm not on my game today, you know, just back me up here a little bit. I can tell you that when I led the Thunderbirds, I did that multiple times. I would be fatigued or I would just feel like I wasn't fully there and I would turn to the number two guy or the number seven guy and I would say, hey, just keep an eye on me today, right? Oh, really? Just hang with me today because, you know, it's not, I'm not fully, I'm, I'm good, but I'm not fully there. So um, I found that to be real beneficial. It's sometimes hard. You don't want to admit that, right? But um, there was so much at, at stake there to me that it was such a small thing to, you know, just sort of be honest enough to admit that. I feel like there's so many pressures that we put on ourselves, though. So this, the self-assessment piece, for me, is very challenging. Yeah. Because you just acknowledging the fact that, hey, I'm kind of off today is really hard. So like, when for you guys, because we had one of our previous conversations, you mentioned like they'd pull off in, in the pad or go into holding. That element of recognizing the fact that, hey, I need to pull back and it's okay to pull back, speak wonders. If I can circle back to the, the question, because there's something I want to bring full circle on that, is for all of you, um, like I said, we've been up here reinforcing the fact that just how human we are, right? And humans are the cornerstone of the NAS. It, it's, it's why we don't have robots doing this job. We adapt, but we got to take all the good and bad that comes with being human, right? What you need to start doing is noticing the things that stand out to you, these slips that are out of character for you, right? There are certain things that I screw up every day that my wife loves to remind me of, right? And it's just become part of who Aaron Katz is at this point, <laughs> right? But for you, if, um, like for me, I would say one week where I had in my previous life, I was working at a nightclub and staying out all night and I had flipped my sleep schedule over. I was so fatigued that in one week, I locked my keys in my car like four times. That's probably not something that people do very often, so I would challenge all of you like, to notice the things that are out of character for you that will start getting you asking the next logical question. Mm -hmm. Is there something that's weighing me down? Is there, am I not sleeping enough? Maybe, um, maybe it's a case where you have to visit with a health professional and check and make sure that um, you don't have sleep apnea, that you don't even notice, right? Um, you don't know why you're fatigued. You feel like I got eight hours of sleep, but what you didn't realize is you were choking all night, right? Um, so it's really, it's really on, the onus is on all of us. I said, no one knows you better than you know yourself. Be honest with yourself. Stop mm -hmm. kidding yourself that you can push through that's when we start to make things, that's when we you know, go down that road of making this about us when it's always about them for the controllers. So no, honestly, well, we only have one more minute before we gotta get out of here, but just to kind of follow up, do you guys have anything else to, with regards to 
big piece of this is how do we help keep mistakes or slips from repeating themselves? So I was going to say honesty. Like Aaron said, be honest with yourself. Some people don't know how to be honest with themselves. But if you, I think, and I've learned to be honest with myself, I, I'm pretty sure, because sometimes honest to a fault. Um, but just sleep. Am I getting enough sleep? Am I eating the right food? Because it's super easy for people to want to keep going and keeping up with all this, this, the responsibilities. And as we get older, we tend to carry, pick up and carry more responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Just, it's okay to let some of them go or ask for help. And there's somebody out there that wants to help. I mean, it's a, we live in a society where being an entrepreneur and, and allowing others to do stuff for us creates a job for somebody else. It's hard to ask for help sometimes. Mm -hmm. I'd like to thank our panelists today. It's about that time. So, <laughs> Aaron, thank you. Sharky, thank you um, for joining us.